Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar on return to work. The Leukemia Foundation acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We recognise their continuing connection to the land, sea and the community. We pay respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and their elders past and present. Before we start today's webinar, a few housekeeping reminders. You can add questions or comments into the chat at any time. This webinar will be recorded and sent to all registered participants. Questions will be attended to in the Q&A segment after we've heard from our three presenters. The information provided today is general in nature and may vary slightly from state to state. Work is an important part of our lives and many people diagnosed with a blood cancer wonder how it will affect their ability to start, continue or resume work and earn an income. This is particularly true at the time of diagnosis and for those who are trying to combine work with ongoing appointments, treatment and side effects. So is it possible to work and manage a blood cancer diagnosis? We have three guest presenters today. Welcome Kate, Olivia and Lachlan, who are here to help shed some light and answer some of these questions. Kate Gale is a wife, a mum of two teenage daughters and your everyday woman who just happens to be a breast cancer survivor, a leukemia thriver. And Kate was diagnosed with ALL in July 2023 and is currently in the maintenance phase for treatment. She works as a practice manager in an allied health practice and is navigating her way back into everyday life. Kate will be sharing with us her personal experience, the ups and downs of how she has managed to return to work and how she continues to navigate this. Welcome, Kate. Thanks, everyone. Okay, guys, my name is Kate, and I'd like to share my personal experience about getting back into the workforce after a blood cancer diagnosis. Unfortunately, I've had a double whammy, and I've been diagnosed twice with the dreaded C word. Firstly, in 2008 with breast cancer, and more recently on July, in July, sorry, 2023 with ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I was working for myself as a hairdresser in 2008. So somehow I managed to push, push through and worked whilst I was having treatment. However, this time around, things were completely different. At the time of diagnosis, I was working as a practice manager in an allied health practice. In the beginning, I felt like I had let my employers down as I literally had to drop everything so I could go and fight. I didn't have a choice. I had to leave work and start treatment immediately. Treatment for leukemia compared to the treatment I had for breast cancer was completely different, and I can only explain it as brutal. I soon learned that this was not only going to be a physical challenge, but a mental game too. So let's fast forward eight months. I'm still having treatment for ALL, but I'm in a place where I believe I can go back to work in some capacity. I felt like I needed to do something more and to have something to work towards. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to walk back into the position that I'd held as practice manager, as there was many things standing in my way, such as fatigue, mental clarity, and I knew that I couldn't fulfill my duties 100%. I'd be taking hours from another employee just so I could see if I could do it. And, my, and in my mind, that wasn't fair. I decided, I decided that I needed to sit down with my employers and have a chat. Was it even an option for me to return to work? I knew physically was going to be a challenge for me. Although I love a challenge, I didn't want to push myself. I also knew I needed to be very honest with myself and my employers. When you're the person going through treatment, you understand the medical world. You understand your blood levels and where you're at. You understand what is safe for you and when you're potentially putting yourself at risk. But most employers don't understand that. Luckily, being in the medical world, mine did. But I still had to point out all the factors that could potentially hinder me being at work and working to my full potential. 
it's scary stepping outside what I call my safe bubble. So we spoke about me firstly doing some book work and financials from home. This would keep my mind going and I'd be slowly stepping back into my role and I wouldn't need to be in the office and put myself at risk of infection dealing with the revolving door of patients. I was excited to start doing this, but I didn't realise how much stress I would put myself under by agreeing to the strategy. I thought I was ready to jump straight back in and just do this, but this wasn't the case. I found that the brain fog, a symptom so generously left by treatment, was a little harder to push through than I first thought. I was terrified I was going to make a mistake and I second guessed everything that I was doing. My employers made me promise to keep them updated with how I was feeling and how I was handling everything and not to push too hard and put too much pressure on myself. This was something I had had to keep repeating to myself over and over again. Don't pressure yourself. I then had a discussion with them about laundering the linen. I was thinking about the business and trying to work out how I could work, be involved, yet not be present. I knew that by doing the laundry was going to be a boring job, but it was something else I could do at home, away from infection risk, and it would keep me moving. I had to start physically building myself up again, and I figured laundering the towels was an option to help out, earn a little extra cash, and begin to build up some physicality again. I was thinking outside the box. So they agreed to this, and I became the official washerwoman. Currently, I'm back in the office doing the odd shift here and there, and I can only do shorter shifts as my body still won't allow me to push too hard. When you add up the entire equation of getting up, showering, getting dressed, and actually getting to work, then mentally being switched on for the entire shift, it's a lot. And the biggest piece of advice I could give anyone in this whole journey is to be honest. Be honest with yourself and with your employers. Lay it all out and explain exactly what's happening, where you're at, and everything will fall into place. We aren't like others, and others don't understand what we've been through or what's happening physically and mentally unless we tell them. I understand it's incredibly frustrating and that you just want to get back to normal. However, now you have a new normal. You need to be kind to yourself whilst you find that new normal. Slow and steady always wins the race. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing that with us all. Next up, we have Olivia. Um, I'd like to introduce Olivia Doidge, an occupational therapist employed as an education and vocation consultant at Victorian Adolescent and Young Adult Cancer Service. Olivia has completed a Bachelor of Occupational Therapy and also graduate certificates in adolescent health and welfare and research. She worked as an occupational therapist at Peter McCallum Cancer Center for five years with adults and young people before joining the Victorian Adolescent and Young Adult Cancer Service in 2012. Her role is to provide education and vocational support to young people with cancer. Welcome, Olivia. So thank you, Kate, for sharing with us such an articulate account of your experiences. I found that patients often find, if they even share with one another, their work challenges and concerns and what strategies they've found helpful and not so helpful. I'm sure that many of you have similar experiences to Kate. You are definitely not alone, as many people find that cancer disrupts their work plans and goals in some way. Furthermore, this impact can continue for a number of years post-treatment. This presentation will hopefully address some of, the, some of your concerns or challenges that you're currently experiencing or may experience in the future by covering the following topics. Considering your options, identifying the factors that are or may affect your work capacity, strategies for reducing or managing the impacts, and additional services and resources that are available, which you might find helpful. I am mindful that my role is working with 15 to 25 year olds who likely have different work support needs. 
particularly in relation to length of time working, stage of career, and additional demands and stresses, such as financial pressure. We'll commence by looking at work options, which may include continuing to work alongside treatment, reducing hours, taking short-term or indefinite leave, resuming, resigning, or obtaining alternative employment. In considering your options and what is best for you, this obviously depends on your specific circumstances. However, an important element of this is determining whether you're able to meet the inherent requirements. Inherent requirements are the essential tasks and activities that need to be performed as part of the positional role. For employees or job applicants who are capable of performing inherent requirements, under Australian law and the Disability Discrimination Act, workplaces are legally required to implement reasonable adjustments. Employers can only refuse to implement reasonable adjustments if the employee is unable to perform inherent requirements, even with adjustments in place, or that would cause unjustifiable hardship. To assist you with considering your work options and what is best for you, it can be helpful to write down the impacts you are experiencing or concerned about and any questions you may have such as, am I able to meet inherent work requirements? Do I need to take leave? Am I physically, cognitively and psychologically able to cope with work demands? Do I need to reduce my hours for a gradual return to work plan? Are there any precautions or restrictions that I need to adhere to? Are there any tasks or activities that I need to avoid? And what supports or reasonable adjustments will assist me at work? Once you've done this, then consider who is best placed to assist you with answering these questions. Is it your treating oncologist, nurse, GP, or other specialist healthcare or employment professional? It is also important to consider your disclosure and communication preferences. Employees are not legally obliged to inform their workplace of their diagnosis unless unable to perform inherent requirements or there are health and safety risks to either themselves or others. However, disclosure can be beneficial for a number of reasons. This includes enabling access to support and adjustments, which can assist with minimising impacts, reducing stress associated with trying to keep it a secret, and preventing assumptions or misunderstandings about the reasons behind any changes to work capacity. Whether, what and how you choose to tell others about your cancer diagnosis is completely up to you and there is no right or wrong approach. However, to reduce being caught off guard, it can be helpful to consider in advance, who do you want to tell? You may be happy for everyone to be informed or for it to be kept contained. What do you want to tell? You may feel comfortable sharing a lot of detail or only the very basics. This could be as simple as saying that you have a medical condition. It can sometimes be helpful to practice what you want to say with family or close friends. Also, how do you want to tell? Do you want to inform colleagues yourself or do you want someone else to do this on your behalf? So we'll now move on to the impact that cancer and its treatment can have on work, engagement and capacity. It is important to note that impacts vary greatly between individuals given different diagnoses, treatment regimes, body responses and work demands. Have a look at some of the common ones experienced by cancer patients. It can be helpful to consider these impacts in terms of physical, cognitive, emotional and practical domains. Physical impacts may include cancer related fatigue, which is one of the most common side effects that cancer patients experience. It is important to distinguish cancer-related fatigue from tiredness, given it's often incredibly debilitating and distressing, can cause a feeling of whole body exhaustion, is not the result of recent physical or mental activity, and generally doesn't resolve with sleep or rest. This can obviously have a severe impact on work capacity. Other physical impacts may include disrupted sleep, pain or discomfort, Impaired mobility, which can make it difficult to sit comfortably or take public transport. 
impaired hand or arm function, which can make it difficult to perform a range of tasks, including writing and typing, and deficits in vision, hearing or speech. Cancer-related cognitive impairment, or CRCI, is another common side effect that can severely hinder work capacity, given it may result in difficulty with thinking clearly and sustaining concentration, comprehending and remembering information, following instructions, planning, organisation and time management, attending to more than one task at a time, completing tasks quickly and efficiently, and communicating with others, which can include keeping up with conversations and finding the right words. These difficulties are likely to be exacerbated in busy, noisy environments where there are many distractions. The exact cause of cancer fatigue and cognitive impairment is unknown. However, research indicates there are a range of contributing factors which differ between individuals. In addition to medical causes, this includes mental health and emotional concerns, inadequate sleep and nutrition, reduced fitness and strength, loss of routine, and also fatigue itself. This is given it is common for patients to experience the boom and bust cycle, which refers to when patients are having a good day Sorry, the boom and bust cycle, which refers to when patients are having a good day and they subsequently complete as many activities as possible and overexert exert themselves. This period of boom is followed by a period of bust where they feel completely exhausted and require extended recovery time. This pattern continues and over, over time decreases their overall activity and energy levels. So in terms of emotional impacts, this may include health-related distress that arises at different time points due to concerns regarding health, anxiety, fear of recurrence, body image concerns due to older appearance, and hypervigilance surrounding symptoms and infection risks. Work-related distress may arise or become heightened when continuing or resuming work due to reduced work capacity, having to develop a new work style and sense of normal, and also having to adjust goals and expectations. So practical impacts may include difficulty balancing work commitments alongside treatment and other demands. It may also include financial stress and pressure to continue working, and also difficulty getting to work if unable to drive or take public transport. So now that we've looked at the impacts, let's move on to how these can be managed. In addition to assisting with answering any questions you have in relation to work, specialist healthcare professionals can also help you with reducing or manage the impact of cancer on work capacity. For instance, occupational therapists can support people to achieve optimal function by addressing physical, cognitive and emotional impacts across all aspects of daily living, including work. This includes strategies for managing cancer-related fatigue and cognitive impairment. Social workers specialise in providing emotional and practical support and can assist with transport, accommodation, financial and legal concerns. Psychologists can provide strategies for managing emotional distress and also provide support with adjusting to life alongside and post-cancer. And physiotherapists and exercise physiologists can address physical and mobility issues and assist with regaining fitness and stamina, which can also improve fatigue. If you no longer have access to these healthcare services via your treating hospital, they can be accessed in the community with costs subsidised via chronic disease management plans and also mental health care plans. Counselling and psychological support can be accessed through employment assistance programs or EAPs that are often available through workplaces. In addition, rehabilitation and careers counselling services may be available via income protection policies or disability employment services. 
There is also a range of government funded and private career counselling services. So now we'll move on to what supports and reasonable adjustments can often be implemented in the workplace. It's important to note that access to these is dependent on the specific impacts you're experiencing, your role and work structure. Some common reasonable adjustments in relation to pain, fatigue and cancer related cognitive impairment include flexible work hours, regular rest breaks, ability to work from home, flexibility with task schedule and deadlines, for instance, completing more demanding tasks when energy levels are highest, minimising multitasking and delegation of non-essential tasks, reducing environmental distractions and decreasing energy expenditure. For instance, changing positions regularly and sitting instead of standing. Supports and reasonable adjustments for employees with a compromised immune system may include promoting infection prevention precautions in a sensitive manner amongst the team, including regular hand hygiene and encouraging anyone with respiratory illness to remain at home or wear a surgical mask if this is not possible. Promoting the uh, seasonal influenza vaccination in the workplace, which has been found to send a strong message of support to employees with a cancer diagnosis and is also an important method of controlling infection exposure. Flexibility with start and finish times to avoid traveling on public transport during peak hour. And additional strategies may be required in certain industries such as healthcare, construction and outdoors. So in addition to these specific reasonable adjustments and supports, it can also be helpful to provide employers and workplaces with education as to how they can provide overall support for an employee with cancer. Many of the impacts experienced by cancer patients are invisible and therefore not often evident or understood by others, including workplaces. From my experiences, employers often want to provide support, however can experience uncertainty as to how to raise or implement this. So education to workplaces can include acknowledging that supporting an employee in his capacity may be a new experience and providing them with reassurance that there are a range of strategies that can be helpful. And also highlighting to them that returning to a safe and supportive workplace can play an important role in their employee's recovery. Strategies can include being aware that whilst the employee may appear to have returned to their pre-cancer self, including looking well. This is often not the case. They often need to develop a new sense of normal and work style. It can also be helpful for workplaces to understand that employees may not know how they will manage at work until after they have resumed, and that side effects often fluctuate in severity and can continue for a number of years post-treatment. In addition, it can be helpful for employees to be aware that health-related distress may arise at different time points, for instance, prior to scans and medical reviews, and that they may experience work-related distress in relation to taking leave, reduced work capacity, or feeling disconnected from their team. Supports that employees often find beneficial include having regular meetings with a key contact, who can review how they are managing, discuss specific concerns with, and revise their work plan if needed. Obtaining preferences with regards to sharing their information with colleagues and others. Providing flexibility to attend medical reviews. And keeping them connected with their team whilst on leave, such as continuing to include in team emails and inviting them to meetings, professional development opportunities, or social events even if they not, may not be able to respond or attend. So how can you raise the need for supports and reasonable adjustments with your employer? As Kate mentioned, setting up a meeting can be extremely helpful. And along with this, it can be beneficial if a healthcare professional provides a work plan or supporting documentation that outlines the reasonable adjustments that are required 
and how they can best support an employee with a cancer diagnosis. To assist with developing this documentation, there are templates, there are templates available, which I'll provide at the end of the presentation. Again, choosing whether you disclose your diagnosis during an interview is a completely personal decision. As mentioned earlier, you're not obliged to disclose unless unable to perform inherent tasks or there are any health or safety risks to yourself or others. However, briefly mentioning your diagnosis can be helpful, particularly if you need to access reasonable adjustments and take time off for medical appointments. Some job applicants Job applicants find it reassuring to take a medical fitness to work certificate with them to the interview. This can save further discussion and demonstrate they've carefully considered their suitability for the role. In looking at employment history gaps, this is common for many people and may be due to a range of non-related health factors. In explaining gaps in an interview, this may include explain explain the time as taking time to consider work priorities and goals. Strategies for making gaps look less obvious include developing a skills-based CV instead of a chronological work history. An inability to meet the essential or inherent work requirements may mean that careers and goals unfortunately need to be reconfigured. This can obviously be incredibly challenging and distressing. In needing to reconfigure your goals, values-based values goal setting can often be helpful. As whilst you may be unable to achieve the goals you have set, you can always work towards your values, which can act like a compass and point you in the direction you want to head. An example of this is a patient I worked with who had a heart set on becoming a nurse. However, unfortunately, due to impaired upper limb function as a result of a bone cancer diagnosis, it was determined that it was unable to perform inherent requirements of a nursing degree. This was understandably devastating for her. However, we adopted values-based goal setting to identify what it was that drew her to nursing in the first place. From this, she was able to identify that her values also aligned closely with social work. I'm pleased to report that she completed her degree a number of years ago and is continuing to find social work a rewarding career. She's also relieved that she did not end up pursuing a career that could have put her um, at risk of further imp impairment. There are a number of services that offer support with career counselling or obtaining suitable employment, and I've provided some of these options at the end of the presentation. My final recommendation is to consider undertaking a short course or courses with many free online options available or volunteering. And again, there's a huge range of options available on Seek Volunteer. Undertaking these pursuits can be beneficial for a number of reasons. This includes improving cancer-related fatigue and cognitive impairment through developing routine and structure. They can also improve work capacity without the performance pressure of work, reduce gaps in your employment history, and possibly introduce you to a career that you had not previously considered. Here is a list of some support service, services that you may find beneficial depending on your needs. And here are some resources that may assist with managing side effects. If you haven't already, I highly recommend looking at the fatigue management module, along with the range of other health and wellbeing seminars and workshops that are available on the Leukemia Foundation website. The Cancer Council also has a number of valuable resources, including a work plan template. I will finish here and leave you with a few takeaway messages. Firstly, many people find that continuing resuming or commencing work alongside of post-treatment to be extremely stressful. However, I want to reassure you that there are a range of strategies and supports that can be helpful. This includes taking time to consider your options and what is best for you, seeking advice in relation to any questions or concerns that you have, accessing support to assist with managing side effects or other impacts, 
and find room that you are legally entitled to reasonable adjustments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia, for your informative presentation. I'm sure everyone has gotten a lot out of that, actually, and all your takeaway messages. Next up, we have Lachlan. Uh, Lachlan's a lawyer in the Industrial and Employment Law team at Slater and Gordon in Canberra. He became a lawyer because he wanted to help everyday people achieve justice and fairness. Lachlan has experience in both employment law and workers' compensation. Going through a workplace dispute can be stressful and confusing. He aims to help his clients by bringing a clear, pragmatic and empathetic approach to their claim and using his expertise to fight for their justice and dignity at work. Thank you, Lachlan. Ooh, can we see my yeah. screen? Is that sharing? I can't. Yes, we've got that. I can't see my slide. <laughs> We can see. Um, uh, what if I go? Sorry. Slides and notes. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Lucky. Terrific. Sorry about that. I knew there'd be a hiccup. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to join this webinar about returning to work. Um, just before I start, I'd like to um, thank the two previous speakers. They did a great job and it was really interesting to hear from, from both of them. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting on. Um, where I am in Canberra, this is the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, um, but I acknowledge that we have people from all around the country on the call today, so I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend this respect to any First Nations people that are joining the session today. Um, my name's Lachlan McGregor. I'm an industrial and employment lawyer with Slater and Gordon Lawyers. Um, I'm based in Canberra in the ACT, uh, but we work all over Australia. Um, specifically, I work across Queensland, New South Wales, the ACT and the Northern Territory. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to come and talk to you all today, um, both because I'm an employment lawyer and I really care about this topic and workers' rights, um, but also because this is a topic that's personally close to my heart. Um, my dad had leukaemia when I was growing up and I understand uh, both personally and professionally what many people might be going through. Uh, so I hope I can bring not just useful insights into the law surrounding this area, but a bit of my own personal understanding and experiences. <clears throat> so firstly, this is just a short legal disclaimer. We touched on it at the start, um, but uh, this is generally about the nature of the information in my presentation. It's general in nature and shouldn't be relied upon as legal advice. To the extent that any of this information does apply to you specifically, you should seek some legal advice um, about how um, about your specific circumstances uh, and don't rely on this as specific legal advice. Okay, so an introduction. Um, I've already said my name's Lachlan McGregor. This is, um, uh, as, as I said, I joined Slater and Gordon at the start of, at the end of 2022. Um, I started as a workers' comp lawyer, which um, was, was really beneficial. It gave me a good insight into um, people not being able to work because of illness and injury, um, and also what it looks like when they want to return to work. I now work in the employment law team, um, which is great because I can help everyday people to achieve justice and fairness. Um, and work with with trade unions, which is something I'm passionate about. Um, so yeah, hopefully my experience is relevant for for everyone on the call today, and I can provide some some useful information. Okay, what are we going to cover? The presentation um, is going to be broken up to three broad categories that will hopefully cover the different circumstances that people might find themselves in when they've been diagnosed with cancer and are thinking about taking some time off work or if they've been off work because of a cancer diagnosis and are wanting to return. <clears throat> uh, firstly, we'll discuss what rights and protections you're entitled to if you're unable to work because of cancer. Secondly, we'll talk about your rights when you're looking to return to work after a period of time off. And finally, we look at what sort of rights that carers have when they're either off work um, to look after someone who does have cancer um, or they're caring for a family member or someone like that. Okay, firstly, what are my rights um, if I cannot work? We're going to run through five broad questions under this category, um, which cover your rights and entitlements when you're unable to work because of an illness. Firstly, do I have to tell my employer about my illness? For many people, as um, the other speakers touched on, it's difficult sometimes to talk to an employer about your health and how it might impact your work. 
some people might be afraid that they might be treated differently or even adversely by their employer if they tell them about their cancer diagnosis. Um, off the bat, there's no law that requires you to tell your employer about a cancer diagnosis or any disability for that matter. So technically, no, you do not have to tell your employer if you've been diagnosed with cancer. However, as both the previous speakers have said, being open with your employer about your diagnosis and how it might impact your work gives them the opportunity to put measures in place to help you if you do need to stop working because of your diagnosis. Um, the same goes for applying for a new job. You don't have to tell your employer about your diagnosis and whether you're still undergoing treatment, um, but it can be helpful to be upfront with them about what your requirements might be uh, to allow them to put certain um, structures in place to support you. What you do need to be honest and open with your employer about is your ability to perform the inherent requirements of your employment uh, and be open with them about how your diagnosis might impact your ability to do your job. We'll talk about that in detail a little bit more, um, noting Olivia's already touched on that in quite, quite deep, in some detail already. Next question, what are my leave entitlements? So under the National Employment Standards, permanent employees are entitled to 10 days paid um, sick and carers leave, which is known as personal leave, Annually, they're entitled to four weeks of annual leave per year, and they're also entitled to long service leave accrual. In addition, <clears throat> employees, including casuals, can also access unpaid leave, including unpaid sick leave, carer's leave, and compassionate leave. Um, if you exhaust your paid sick leave, but are still unwell, you might be able to access your other paid entitlements like um, your annual leave and long service leave. This will be a discussion with your employer. Uh, if you exhaust all your paid leave entitlements and um, you're an untitled, you may be untitled, you are entitled, sorry, to take unpaid leave if your absence can be supported by medical evidence. Um, so that's why it's important to get some medical uh, evidence to support um, your diagnosis in the event that you uh, have exhausted all your leave and, and need to uh, take unpaid leave. Um, it's important to note in most circumstances, your employer can't take adverse action against you because you've exercised your right to take paid or unpaid leave. Okay, next, this is uh, leads into the next point. Does my employer have to grant my leave? Essentially, the rule is that your employer must not unreasonably refuse leave requests. Reasonableness is not a hard and fast rule, uh, but the general test requires a consideration of whether the leave would have a large impact on the operational requirements of the business. Having an open dialogue with your employer about your illness can help them to understand when you may need leave and enable them to make whatever changes are necessary to cater for your absence. If it looks like you're gonna be off work for an extended period of time, it may be good to have a conversation with your employer and seek their uh, consent to taking an approved leave of absence for an extended duration. Next question, can I be sacked if I'm not fit for work? If you're away from work because of an illness for less than three months, you are protected from being terminated. However, if your absence is more than three consecutive months in a row or more than three months in a 12 month period, you are not protected um, under the legislation from being terminated. Uh, even in these circumstances though, where you may have gone beyond that three month period, protections may still apply. So that includes if your termination is harsh, unjust or unreasonable, or if the uh, dismissal is based on a protected reason under the Fair Work Act, including if it's based on your disability. Again, if your employer has approved leave in excess of the three months, so if you have that conversation with them beforehand and they grant you an extension of leave beyond that three month period, they can't then turn around after the fact and terminate your employment. So again, this goes to the point of how important it is to have those conversations with your employer early on uh, and get agreement about your leave as soon as possible. Essentially what underlies whether you can be terminated because of an illness or disability in most cases depends on whether you are no longer able to undertake the inherent requirements of your job. Um, so what are the inherent requirements of your job? Olivia's already touched on this, but essentially they're the core duties that must be carried out in order for an employee to fulfill the purpose of their position. For example, if your job involves a lot of manual labor, like you work in a warehouse uh, and because of your illness, it's unlikely you would ever be able to do that sort of work again then it may be the case that you're no longer able to perform the inherent requirements of your employment. Uh, in these circumstances, your employer is not under any legal obligation to keep employing you or offer you an alternate position or duties. 
However, it's important to also consider whether reasonable adjustments or other arrangements can be made to accommodate your illness or disability whilst working. And we'll talk about this in detail over the next few slides. Finally, what support payments can you access if you um, can't work because of an injury or illness? Um, there are many support payments uh, that you um, are able to access, the most obvious of which is the, whoops, how can I get my notes to scroll down a bit there? <laughs> uh, sorry. So the most obvious of it is the disability support payments. Um, uh, as we've sort of touched on, cancer is um, considered a disability in Australia. So you are entitled to um, a disability support payments if you're unable to work. Um, I'm just trying to get my notes. I'm having a little bit of slideshow issue. So um, the other one you can have uh, have access to if you have a superannuation fund is income protection and total and permanent impairment payments. Um, this is quite specific and it depends on your superannuation fund and your personal circumstances. So it's very hard to give advice, um, but generally income protection can be a great resource if you're unable to work for a period of time. Um, and obviously if you are permanently unable to return to your work, you may be able to access TPD entitlements. Um, if you're accessing TPD entitlements, you can also access your income protection payments on top of that. So that's quite a good protection um, for, for if you aren't able to return to work. Again, though, um, I would urge people to speak uh, seek specific legal advice in relation to that because it is quite um, specific to their fund, uh, what their fund offers and their own circumstances. Okay, so the key takeaways from that present uh, from, from um, taking time off work because of an illness. If you're a permanent worker, you're entitled to pay sick leave if you're unable to work because of an illness. All employees are entitled to at least two days um, of unpaid sick leave a year. Um, that's sorry, not all employees, casual employees are entitled to at least two days of unpaid sick leave. Um, you're protected from being terminated if you have not been if you have been off work because of an illness for less than three months. Um, whether you have capacity to undertake the inherent requirements of your job is an important consideration um, when you're thinking about your employment rights. And you may be able to access income protection and TPD payments through your superannuation fund. Next, we're going to look at your rights when you've been away from work um, with an illness uh, and are thinking about making a return. Again, we're going to run through five broad questions that will cover your rights and entitlements uh, in this situation. Okay, firstly, am I entitled to return to work if I've been away with an illness? The short answer is yes. If you've remained employed, even if you've had time off, you're, you're entitled to return to your job. Um, as we touched on before, the key question your employer will be concerned with is whether you still have capacity to safely perform the inherent requirements of your job. Uh, in this case, your employer may request medical evidence from your treating practitioners that confirms and supports that you do have capacity to work in your previous role safely. If you are able to return to your previous duties um, to an extent but require some changes to accommodate you, you have a right to request your employer make reasonable adjustments to accommodate your return to work. So what are reasonable adjustments? Olivia touched on them in, in some great detail. Um, I'm going to expand on that a little bit from a legal perspective. Um, as we went through, there are really any changes to the work environment or your conditions that allow people with a disability, such as cancer, to return to work safely and productively. Um, for example, a reasonable adjustment that we commonly see um, is making a uh, modifications to a workstation, which might be a different chair, um, a standing desk, um, a, a larger monitor to help you see better. Um, something like, uh, I've seen a lot of people need to be closer uh, to the bathroom um, and have their desk moved to a, sit, uh, to a position that's a bit closer to the restrooms. So that's another reasonable adjustment. Um, it might also be things like taking more breaks or longer breaks throughout the period of your workday. The reasonableness of the requested adjustment is uh, requires a consideration of how effective the adjustment will be in helping the worker, how practical it is to make that adjustment, including any disruptions it may cause to the organisation at large, and the financial costs of the adjustment, which includes whether the employer has capacity to meet the costs for making the adjustments. Reasonable adjustments can also include things like flexible working arrangements. Employees have a right to request flexible working arrangements under the National Employment Standards if they have a disability. 
Flexible working arrangements may include working part-time, starting and finishing at different hours, working shorter hours or less days, or working from home. Again, where these requests are reasonable in the circumstances, your employer is required to make these adjustments and provide flexible work arrangements for you. Next, what if on my return to work, my employer changes my role without my consent? The general rule is that your employer cannot just unilaterally change your role. In order to do so, your employer would need your consent and agreement to the new role, which would usually mean that you would be provided with a new employment contract that sets out your new role and duties in some detail, and you would be required to sign and agree to that. In essence, this would amount to a termination of your old employment, which could give rise to an unfair dismissal or adverse action claim if this new role placed you in a worse position than you were in before, or if the reason for the decision was discriminatory. For example, if you thought they were putting you in a worse position or making you sign a new contract because of your cancer diagnosis, um, or if, if because they don't wanna make reasonable adjustments for you and they're annoyed that they've had to do that. Um, so that brings me to the next point. What if I am discriminated against at work because I have cancer? Um, as I've said previously, cancer is considered a disability and discriminating against someone because of their disability is illegal under the Disability Discrimination Act 1992. Um, disability is also considered a protected attribute under the Fair Work Act. So you're protected from being discriminated uh, in your employment if you have because you have a disability. Um, uh, so this means that if you do face discrimination in your employment and the discrimination is because of your cancer diagnosis, um, you can um, lodge a claim in the Fair Work Commission against your employer, either to have that discrimination cease or if you're unable to work because of that discrimination, you can claim compensation for that. Now, discrimination can be direct or it can be indirect. Direct discrimination is when someone treats you differently to someone else because, for example, you've had to take more time off work because of your diagnosis. Uh, direct discrimination could include things like demotion, not promoting someone, or terminating them because of their disability. Um, indirect discrimination is a little bit more difficult, a little bit more nuanced, and not as straightforward. It's essentially when a policy, rule, or a practice um, of an organisation that seemingly applies to everyone equally may have the unintended consequence of disadvantaging people uh, with a disability. Um, for example, if your employer didn't allow you to work from home because they had some broad policy that staff can't work from home, but if you could show it was reasonable and necessary for you to work from home because of your cancer diagnosis, this could amount to indirect discrimination. Um, I like to often think of indirect discrimination um, just as... Um, a building not having an access ramp for someone in a wheelchair, something like that. You, many people might not notice it, but if you're in a wheelchair and you can't get in, um, that's discrimination against against someone who's who's uh, in a wheelchair. So what happens if you're discriminated against at work? The first step is to seek advice, either from a lawyer or your trade union or another, someone with, with expertise in this area. It's usually best to take steps to address the matter internally first. So either talking to your manager or HR about the issue and trying to resolve it that way. If that doesn't resolve the issue, there are various legal avenues available to you that you can take in order to assert your right not to face discrimination at work. This includes in the Fair Work Commission, in the Australian Human Rights Commission, and at any state and territory based human rights and anti-discrimination commission. So there are there are um, federal laws in the in the um, Discrimination Act and in the um, Fair Work Act, but there are also state-based anti-discrimination and, and anti-disability discrimination laws that apply um, to you depending on where you live. And you can take action um, in your state or territory. Um, so taking a claim to any of these jurisdictions um, will first involve a conciliation hearing where essentially both parties meet, so you and your employer would meet, to try and resolve the matter informally with the assistance of the commission. So this would generally involve you sitting down, discussing the issue, trying to uh, mediate or negotiate the issue uh, and, and find a resolution that way. Um, you have to go through that course of action for, for pretty much all of these jurisdictions. You have to go through a course of conciliation or mediation before you can go further. Um, however, if it is unsuccessful, if you can't reach common ground or can't get an outcome through conciliation, you can then consider taking further legal action uh, and seeking to have the matter formally arbitrated. Uh, that could be in, in state-based courts, that could be in federal courts like the Federal Circuit or the um, Federal Court of Australia. So 
key takeaways from that section. Firstly, you're entitled to return to work if you are able to safely undertake the inherent requirements of your job. As I've said, if you can get medical evidence to this effect, if you've got your doctor working with you, um, that can be really useful to just get your employer's confidence that you can come back and do the job. Um, your employer must provide reasonable adjustments to support your return to work. This includes providing flexible work arrangements. Your employer cannot change your role upon returning to work without your consent. And as I've said, even if they do, even if you do consent, if that role is at less pay, if it's more junior in some way, in any way discriminates you or puts you in a worse position and you believe um, they've done that because of your disability, then you may have a claim against them. Uh, finally, it is illegal to discriminate against someone because they have cancer. If you are unfairly discriminated against in your employment, you may be able to make a general protections claim or a disability discrimination claim broadly. Okay, the final slide we're going to look at is what are my rights as an employee when I'm caring for someone with cancer? We're going to look at three broad questions um, that cover this topic. So firstly, um, as discussed earlier, what are my leave entitlements as a carer? Well, essentially, they're the same as any other employee. Um, all permanent employees are entitled to a minimum of 10 days personal leave annually, which includes the right to take care as leave. Uh, an employee is entitled to take care as leave to care for or support a member of their immediate family or household who is sick, injured, or has an unexpected emergency. If you use up all your paid carers leave, you also have the right to take at least two days of unpaid carers leave per year. Just like sick leave, your employer can't refuse to grant carers leave as long as it's legitimate and it's in line with the above reasons. Again, if you're a carer, it's also important to be having that conversation with your employer about your caring responsibilities and putting support and, and structures in place that allow you to take that leave if it's necessary, particularly if you've run out of paid leave. Um, if you do require, it, it can be required that you produce medical evidence. Um, it, in that case, it's best to just comply as best as you can um, to, to provide evidence to support um, the need to take that leave. Next, can I be fired because of my caring responsibilities? The short answer is no. Caring responsibilities are a recognised protected attribute under the Fair Work Act, just like disability is a recognised protected attribute. That means terminating someone because of those responsibilities as a carer would amount to unlawful discrimination, which could give rise to a general protections claim. That being said, if your caring responsibilities become such that you can no longer take the inherent requirements of your job, you may not be protected um, from adverse action like being terminated or, or stood down or, or in other ways um, reprimanded by your employer. Um, for example, and, and an issue I've had recently, if a carer has exhausted all their leave entitlements, um, but they continue to take um, unapproved time off work to care for someone um, either with cancer or another disability, this could amount to an unapproved absence, which could result in disciplinary action, including termination. Um, that's quite an interesting one in, in my case. And again, it goes back to um, having open uh, dialogue with your employer early on. Um, the person I was assisting had not. Uh, they had essentially just stopped talking to their employer and stopped coming to work, um, and that put them in this position. I think if they had been open and honest with their employer, engaged their employer early on, um, and worked with their employer to make the situation, you know, work for everyone to the best it can, um, we could have uh, avoided um, any sort of uh, uh, discipline reaction at work. Um, so just as uh, disabilities, um, uh, workers with a disability are entitled to request reasonable adjustments, so to our carers. So this includes the right to request flexible working arrangements. Um, so you may be able to request certain adjustments in order to allow you to continue caring for someone whilst you're undertaking your employment duties. This could include working from home some days, going part-time to take care of someone, working less days. Again, you have this right, um, uh, but... Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a national employment standard right um, in the Fair Work Act. But again, it's having the conversation early on, talking to your employer about it um, and just being open is, is usually the best way rather than just dogmatically um, asserting a right. Okay, finally, can my employer discriminate against me because I'm caring for someone with cancer? Um, as we talked about before, caring responsibilities are a protected attribute under the Fair Work Act. Um, so any discrimination someone faces in their employment because of their caring responsibilities, whether that's indirect or direct, 
uh, could amount to unlawful discrimination that may give rise to a claim in employment law. Um, this also applies, um, obviously, outside of employment, if in another way you're discriminated against based on your caring responsibilities. Um, we're mainly talking about employment today, so I'm going to focus on that. So, um, for instance, an example might be if you don't get a promotion at work that um, you, you really should have and, and someone else in the same position as you and at the same level does get that promotion, um, and really the only difference is you'd have to take time off work because you were caring for someone with cancer, um, you could potentially bring a dis discrimination claim against your employer under the Fair Work Act. So that's a circumstance where, where the right to take that action could apply to you. So key takeaways from that section. Carers have a right to access 10 days of personal leave annually to undertake caring responsibilities. Now that's 10 days of paid personal leave, that includes sick leave, uh, and that all is in that same bucket. So if you take five days of sick leave in a year, then you only have five days left to, to uh, take care of its leave. Um, it's not a flat 10 days for caring responsibilities. Secondly, you can only access caring leave when someone in your immediate family or household is sick, injured, or is in an unexpected emergency um, under the law. That's the that's the definition of, of carer's leave. Um, carer's responsibilities are recognised as a protected attribute under the Fair Work Act 2009. Um, and finally, terminating or discriminating against someone because of their caring responsibilities could give rise to a general protections claim. Uh, next, I've got a question slide, but we're going to go through a Q&A session, so we'll leave that for now. Um, and finally, I've got some resources here. Um, I'll make the slide pack available so you can access it. Um, these are some things that I, um, I think are really helpful. I've tried to group them um, as best I could, uh, but a lot of them sort of apply to, to different areas as well. So um, the Fair Work Ombudsman has some great fact sheets and information, as do the um, ACTU or the Australian Trade Union website has great information for workers as well. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for, for listening. I hope this helped um, and I'll pass back to the team. I'll stop sharing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Liv, Lockie and Kate for incredibly informative um, presentations um, coming, coming at it from really, really different angles. Um, but obviously there's lots of crossover in, in what you were talking about. And certainly some really key key themes came out um, in, in that information um, that we'll get to explore more now um, in this conversation. Um, we've also had some really interesting commentary in the chat that I'd like to acknowledge. Um, you know, some people who have been talking about having some really tricky work situations that they've had to navigate. Um, upon disclosure of their cancer diagnosis. Um, and one person who I think really um, said it um, really succinctly around, um, it's really tricky. It's hard to fight. I think this was Helen. It can be hard to fight battles when you are also fighting a cancer battle. So, you know, for many people, it is that, you know, I, I, I only got enough energy to focus on, dealing with my actual health, let alone having to um, put the efforts and time and, and, and um, energy into um, dealing with this as well. So um, obviously that's why people like Lockie and Liv exist to help support people, um, to help um, and to navigate through uh, these really tricky scenarios. So let's kick off. Um, I invite Kate, Lockie and Liv to take um, yourselves off mute. Um, and while some questions might be more specifically legally focused or, or, or vice versa, they might be more around strategy, managing strategies for return to work. I mean, if you feel you have something to add that might just really um, uh, 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 elaborate or uh, offer some value for that response, please, um, please do. Um, Liv, uh, we'll, start, we'll start with you. Um, and, and um, this might also sort of cross over for you, Kate, too. Um, can I ask, when you, um, what do you advise um, um, families and caregivers when they're supporting someone who's trying to return to work? So I guess live from your perspective as an OT, but Kate, you know, what was helpful and not helpful for you from perhaps the people around you um, 
in encouraging you in that time um, for returning to work or contemplating return to work? Um, like I said in, in my presentation, being really up and honest with with everybody that surrounds you, not just your employer, your your family at home, um, nobody, you know, they might see you every day and um, can see what you're going through, but no one actually knows exactly how you're feeling. So verbalising it um, and telling them, um, not just expecting them to know how you're feeling um, because they don't. <laughs> So yeah, being very open and honest and and just to have their support to know that you want to go back to work is is a big thing. So um just openly say to them, you know, do you think this is a good idea that I'm I'm heading back to work? Can you support me in doing this? Um yeah, that's that's Great. just a, probably the biggest thing. Thanks, Kate. Liv, hey, did Kate. you want to add anything to that? Kate, from my experience, the patients I work with say extremely similar things. And I think, um, I think firstly, it's that acknowledging that although patients have returned to what may seem like normal and they're looking healthy, it's often not the case. And I think sometimes comments with the best intentions, such as, you look amazing and you're ready to go back into the world and achieving credit can often be unhelpful. I think, and patients can often find that incredibly distressing because then they feel like these expectations are put on them that they actually are meant to now go back into the world with this new sense of enthusiasm and motivation, which we know is often not the case mm. because of all the other impacts they're experiencing. I think, too, in terms of carers and families, I think it can be really helpful if they educate themselves about the impacts. So it's not the patient having to educate them, they're actually looking at the resources that are available and actually educate themselves about cancer-related fatigue. And I do want to highlight, like, I think it's, I see a lot, especially for the young patients I work with, often they'll have comments such as when they talk about their fatigue, often that's, and again, with the best intentions, people often respond, I feel exhausted as well, but they haven't been out partying until 2 a.m. This fatigue has come through no fault of their own, well, nothing that they've actually done and it's just occur unfortunately occurred as part of their treatment. So comments such as, I also feel extremely fatigued, often very unhelpful. <laughs> I think if people can educate themselves about these impacts and actually using the right terminology, cancer-related fatigue and cancer-related cognitive impairment, I think can sometimes be helpful. And I also think because there's so many other demands on patients, such as attending treatment and concerns about their medical status, I think other support needs are hard to actually address because there's too much other things going on. So I think if family or carers or whoever it may be can actually assist with scheduling those appointments with other healthcare professionals, that can also sometimes be helpful because I think sometimes if you said to someone, oh, you need to make this phone call to schedule this appointment, it's too much. Mm. Sometimes actually reducing that burden can be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you very thorough response. I certainly think uh, it, what I've heard from the three of you um, today is probably the, the most critical element is that communication piece. And that, um, so whilst there's not an obligation to communicate your diagnosis, and I'm referring specifically to your employers, but obviously in, in relation to being able to make reasonable adjustments, and I've heard that term a lot, today as well, um, that, that, that communication piece is, is really, really essential. Um, Liv, uh, Lockie or Kate, would you, is there any other sort of key elements of that, you know, of communication um, that you'd like to share, um, pieces of advice around approaching? I think for some people it is, how do I start that conversation? Um, with my employer, um, any any wise well, I, words that you I might would just have? Say not so much about approaching the, the conversation, but it just again, not to harp on about the importance of communication. But from a legal perspective, the right um, not to be discriminated against and, and all those sort of legal entitlements that I talked about 
basically, you can only assert them if it is the fact that your employer is discriminated against you because of your disability or because of your cancer diagnosis. If you don't ever tell them about your cancer diagnosis, if you're just taking a lot of time off work, you're not talking to anyone, you're distant from the workplace, you're not doing your job. If they terminate you because of that, you can't claim that it was based on discrimination because they never knew about it. Um, it, it you really have to prove, um, or I'll, I should make the point too, in employment law, the, the onus in, in a disability discrimination claim is on your employer actually to um, prove that they didn't terminate you because of right. the protected reason. So it's a, what we call a reverse onus, unlike in mm -hmm. other jurisdictions where the person presenting the claim has to meet the standard of proof. But um, yeah, yeah, having that just as a sort of legal protection for yourself, being open, communicating with them um, means that if they do turn around and discriminate against you or treat you unfairly in some way, um, it's more likely or you have a better argument that it's because of the disability that that, that discrimination is happening. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a very good point. If they don't, if they haven't been formally advised the pr yeah. How do you prove that then? Yeah. Good point. Good point to that, sure. I just also want to add that I think, Disability can sometimes, especially for um, cancer patients, they may not identify that they have a disability because it's not in, sometimes it's not in the traditional sense of what we imagine or what we consider to be a disability. But in terms of the impacts that it can have on your life, yes, it definitely meets the criteria of the broad definition of disability. Yeah. So don't be yeah. put off by the term. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I, I think going on from that, Liv, and I think, Lockie, you use this um, example of, you know, someone who um, is in a wheelchair, a reasonable accommodation is having a ramp to, access, to be able to access, you know, the building. Um, and I, I, I think there's something to be said about um, uh, disabilities that are sometimes really visible versus those that are more invisible um, and people can't, yeah, can't see them. So if they can't be seen, to some okay. people they don't exist. Yeah. Um, and so that can often be much trickier for people who, who have blood cancer to, to navigate that. Um, lots of questions here. And actually just off the back of um, uh, Liv, you mentioned something there um, just about that dis that definition of disability. And someone was asking, um, and this perhaps is for you, Lockie, um, but open for everyone to comment on, are we still considered as having a disability when we're several years on um, after treatment and after a transplant? So this person had a acute myeloid leukemia and an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, so some significant effects after those types of treatment. You know, can someone still be classed as having a disability yeah. after an extended period of time? That's that's a really interesting question. And um, again, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of this just sort of, it's your personal circumstances. Um, and, and again, I'm, I can only sort of advise broadly, but to the extent that you are still suffering from, from um, cancer, whether it be from the treatment that you've received in some way, if you still are suffering because of that, you have a disability. Um, the, the definition of disability is, is quite broad um, and it encompasses a lot of things. Um, so you, you wouldn't be sort of um, excluded from relying on, on the disability provisions in legislation purely because, you know, you're in remission or something like that. It has to be, it has to be, um, you have to be able to prove that whatever reasonable adjustment or whatever flexible work arrangement you have is going to address some portion of the disability you've got. You know, if you've got no symptoms, but you're just like a nicer office, um, that really wouldn't be um, reasonable. So, but if if because of your cancer and your treatment, you now have a vision uh, impairment or something like that, you could have had cancer five years ago, but because of that, you now have um, something wrong with your vision or you need some assistance. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's because of your cancer or just because you have that disability, you are still entitled to request reasonable adjustments to mm -hmm. accommodate for that. So yep. yeah, great question. It is, it is, um, it is complicated and it is um, nuanced depending on your circumstances, but broadly, if you are, if there is some, if, if for some reason you have a, a disability, a physical or, or mental or anything that impacts your ability to do your job. And if there are reasonable adjustments available that will assist you to do your job, um, you can request them. 
if your employer denies them, um, then you might want to speak to a lawyer or your union or someone like that um, about disputing that decision. And to that, I completely agree, Lockie, with what you've just said. And from a healthcare professional point of view, definitely because it's actually about how it's impacting your life. And if you're still experiencing impacts, then yes. So I think in that instance, it's important to speak to a healthcare professional to get supporting documentation, outlining what those impacts are and what reasonable adjustments you may require. Great. Yeah. So it's not about the time frame; It's about the impact um, on your capacity to, to do that work. So, um, and, and we know for many people with blood cancer, there are long, long-term and late effects of, of blood cancer and its treatment. So um, that's, that's really, really helpful to know. Thank you. Um, Lockie, this one's for you. Um, this is a pre-submitted question. Do you have the right to return to work is there a legal um, is there a legal period before being made redundant or no longer employed? Mm. Yeah, good question. So the right to return to work first, um, essentially, um, I'm just going to note being made redundant as well, so I remember to answer that. But your right to return to work, essentially, if you um, are cleared to return to work, if you have capacity and you have a medical certificate that says you can do this job or if the medical certificate says you can do this job with reasonable adjustments, um, like they can do this job for, you know, two hours, three days a week or something like that, whatever it is, you have a right to, to return to work. Um, your employer can say, well, look, we're not able to accommodate for that. They need to give a, a substantial reason that and, and show that they, they couldn't actually accommodate you returning to work. Um, or if they had a genuine concern that you weren't able to safely undertake the inherent requirements of your job anymore. Yeah. Um, so broadly, yes, you do have that right to, to come back to work. Um, most employers want that. They don't want people off work for an extended period of time. Um, uh, so they will encourage you, uh, hopefully, to, to get back to work where it's safe and practical for you to do so. In terms of how long you can be off work before um, being made redundant. Well, being made redundant is one thing. Um, essentially, you have, as I said, three months um, either consecutively or three months in a 12-month period where you are protected from being terminated again. So if you've been off work for two months because of treatment or something like that and you're terminated, that's unlawful. Um, so you can, you can have a claim against your employer, you're protected against that. Um, after the three-month period, it's a little bit more unclear um, the protection doesn't apply, but look, in most circumstances, and this goes back to the communication thing, if you're having communications with your employer, if you're open with them um, about what's going on, and also, you know, say, look, I think I'm going to need four months off or five months off. This is what my doctor's saying. Can you agree to it? And they give you that assurity and they, you know, agree to it. They can't turn around and say, you know, you know actually, I don't like you being off this long and we're going to terminate you. Um, in terms of being made redundant, well, that's a different thing. Redundancy is when your role is no longer required. Um, the operational requirements of the business oh. don't need that role anymore. If you are terminated based on a redundancy, if your employer says we're making your role redundant, um, even if it's with outside that three-month period, um, it, you might have a claim that that's an unfair dismissal and it's not a genuine redundancy. If that role is still being undertaken and the reason for making you redundant is actually because you've exercised your right to leave or you've or, or because you've got a disability and are requesting reasonable adjustments, something like that, for example. So it depends on on the genuineness of the of the um, redundancy as well. Yeah, what the the rationale for it? Yeah, look, if that role is still being undertaken um, by mm. some, if you know that, well, hang on, I'm a you know, this is an essential role to this organisation. There's no way this role is redundant. It's yep. one thing to get rid of the person; it's another thing to get rid of the role. The ro Correct. Yeah. And that's the different, yeah, the differentiation there. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, just talking about sort of the legal and um, side of things. Um, can you explain the difference between um, income protection and TPD, um, which is total permanent disability? And do either of those, accessing either of those impact a person's ability to return to work? It's, it's, um, that's a great question. Um, 
so I, I don't really specialize and, and I can answer this question, but 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 um TPD and superannuation is its own sort of area of law. It's quite complicated and, and there's specialist lawyers, um, including at Slater and Gordon, who offer that that service um to to workers. Um, essentially, though, income protection, and it depends on what your scheme is. So uh, it's different. There's not a sort of universal scheme. It depends on what your superannuation fund offers. So income protection is more of a short term thing. Mm -hmm. If you're off work for a period of time, I think for, for most funds, it's seven days. Some um, it's 30 days. But but you have to be off work for a sort of an extended period of time and you can access that um, that benefit. Total and permanent disability payments are typically... Um, so where income protection is kind of to supplement your wages because you're unable to work, total and disability, total and permanent disability payments are typically like a lump sum amount that you're able to claim through your superannuation fund. Um, that's a different process that you kind of need to get medical evidence that you do that, that you are unlikely to ever be able to return to that job or really any job in the future. It depends on what your fund's requirements are. But that's really the difference. Income protection is more of a short term um, a supplement, whereas total and permanent disability is like a lump sum payment um, that you can get um, when you're um, certified as no longer being able to work. If you are certified as no longer being able to work and you are getting TPD payments, if your fund also has income protection payments, you can concurrently claim both. Yeah. So you can get both payments through that scheme. Um, I had a chat to look, um, our superannuation team, um, uh, it sort of advised me the best thing to do for most people is to just reach out to a lawyer and have a chat. It's very complicated. Um, it's really nuanced and it depends on your personal situation and your claim and all, yep. oh, sorry, all super funds are different and have super, uh, different claims. Um, most firms um, or lots of firms, including Slater and Gordon, where I work, offer a free initial consultation. So if you just want to have a chat to someone about your specific circumstances, I'd recommend reaching out to a lawyer and having a chat. Um, because it is quite nuanced and difficult and there's a lot of moving parts. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, talking about payments, um, is it possible for people to supplement their income? Um, and this might be something um, um, lock, whether Lockie or Liv you know are aware of, whether people can, you know, do some, still do some work while they're claiming, say, Centrelink benefits, you know, what is your understanding of um, that and what are what's someone's obligations around um, uh, communicating with Centrelink about their work um, uh, activities? Um, I would, I would just, so in terms of um, income protection, I think um, that you have to actually be off work. So you can't use it to sort of supplement your income. Um, so if you're working three days, you can't use the income protection to give you a full a full salary. Um, in terms of Centrelink, and um, it, it's it's a little bit different and I'm, I'm probably not um, as across Centrelink and how people can access it. But generally, yes, you need to be quite open and, uh, and transparent with Centrelink about any work you are doing um, because... Um, if there is a situation where you are working and Centrelink has been paying you on the assumption that you're not working at all, um, you can get in some strife uh, legally um, uh, and also have to repay a fair bit of money back to Centrelink. So again, you know, being open, honest, transparent about what you're doing with Centrelink, working with them, um, whether whether that is to supplement your income in some way, if you can do some work, um, you know, obviously a situation where a person you want to be able to return to work, um, but you're not going to do so if it means um, you're only working one day a week and relying on one day salary or something. That's just impractical. So uh, there are those payments uh, out there. I won't sort of. I'm not. I'm not versed in in the specific schemes yep. and how they work. But but um, yeah, being open, transparent, honest is always the the best practice um, yep. from a legal perspective. Yeah, yeah and in terms of those Centrelink payments. So the two main ones that we I see patients often access is the Disability Support Pension, or DSP, and also JobSeeker, which sounds unusual, but they can actually access JobSeeker with medical exemption from actually having to apply for jobs. And with both those, and again, this depends on individual circumstances, but you can work for a reduced number of hours per week and still receive Centrelink payments. And so I think that's a question often social workers can help you answer that. Um, there might be other supports available or actually contacting Centrelink directly, which I know that can be often a very difficult task. 
Um, yeah, so I don't know if the Leukemia Foundation has any other supports in relation to that that can be helpful to investigate. Yeah, great. Thanks, Liv. Um, yeah, we're certainly aware that there is some capacity, but there is a threshold um, as to how much someone can actually work un until it then starts to impact the payment itself. So um, always, yeah, open honesty, transparency is the best, the best approach. Um, what we've seen in the chat and and certainly, you know, from what um, you know, Kate, you spoke to, and also Liv, what you certainly touched on in terms of those um, psychological effects of return to work, and um, I think it would be fair to say that that's often um, not acknowledged as much as the physical effects um, and of returning to work. So. Um, I'm wondering if you might be able to comment on that because certainly in some of the pre-submitted questions, there was a lot around lack of motivation and a loss of confidence that people have um, after a diagnosis and, um, you know, what what will they be able to perform when they go back into the workplace? And um, so, yeah, I would love your just some more commentary on that, um, you know, what, what worked, you know, what sound words of advice could you perhaps give to those people who are struggling with that lack of confidence or that 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 um, motivation yeah for, well from my point of view it you have to find your, your happy place that happy medium of um you know every day is different every day is different like so you might uh be brain fog one day massively um the next day you're on your steroid course or something like that and you are bouncing off the walls and you feel like you can take on the world um but there's that boom in the bust where mm. you know you have to find that that happy medium um self-confidence is a massive one so you know I know it seems that um Asking for help all the time is a, is a massive big thing, but you really do need to just reach out and ask for help, um, whether that, that be with a, a counsellor, with your your medical team, um, because the mental the mental barriers are huge compared to the, well, I, in my instance, you know, compared to the physical side of things, I still struggle a hell of a lot with all of that, but the mental is a daily process that you know I have to go through so reaching out and asking for help and and making sure that people know that you're not okay at a certain time um that's huge yeah just to take that leap and say I'm not dealing I'm not okay I haven't got the confidence to do this um because that that just chips away and eats away at you constantly so reach out and say that I'm not okay ask for that help Thanks, Kate. Liv, did you want to add anything to that? Um, you know, even from the point of view of, you know, how can someone who perhaps lacks that confidence um, to get back into the workplace and take that, you know, you talked about some of the strategies of that return to work. What are some, you know, perhaps some things that people can do to that to build their confidence up? practical things perhaps to to move them towards that return to work um that is their ultimate goal perhaps yeah really good question i and this obviously depends on each individual person but i have found you know and again i acknowledge that i work with much younger patients but i have found undertaking short courses or volunteering as yeah. a really non-pressure way of building back that capacity yep. i i also think it's really important to understand that these impacts are really real you're not made up they're not something that you that you're not going crazy they're actually really real impacts that i'd say the majority of cancer patients experience at some point and i think from that point these reasonable adjustments are not some like special thing that you're asking for they're called reasonable for a reason and you're legally, and again, I'll reiterate that they're, you're legally entitled to access these to actually support you in the workplace. Yep. I think that, and then I also think if it's really affecting 
your ability to manage on a day to day basis. And I think accessing more formal support and whether that be through a psychologist or a counselling service, I think that can also really help to have someone who's not family or friends to actually discuss these concerns with. Yeah, some good advice there. Thank you. That pretty much draws our um, our Q and A to a to a close. Um, I think we've covered a huge uh, uh, amount of information in a very very uh, short time. Um, certainly, you know, this has been lots of really uh, uh, re really helpful information. But we rec you know, but please know that you know each individual situation is so unique, and so it is really important that you seek that specific. Um, advice, um, you know, from your local, you know, if that's a lawyer or, you know, a vocational support in, in your region. Um, but I'd like to thank um, Lockie, Liv and Kate for an exceptional conversation. Um, and we have had a really, really active chat and I haven't had the privilege of being able to read through it all, but I can certainly see it's it's really, really busy. So people are really engaged and finding the, the information incredibly helpful. So thank you once again. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Alicia to close out um, the webinar for today. Thanks, Linda. Um, yes, I will also say thank you to each of our guest speakers uh, for the incredible amount of information provided today. Uh, Kate, thank you for your honesty and generosity in sharing your story and your experience. Uh, Lachlan and Olivia for sharing their knowledge and expertise and for all of you for sharing your time with us today. Most importantly, thank you to the audience. We encourage you to use the information that you've heard today to start conversations with your family, friends, employers, colleagues, and healthcare teams to help guide you to manage your work life with blood cancer. If you need uh, any further information, check out the resources on our website by the QR code on the screen or to speak with someone, please call our blood cancer support line on 1800 620 420. We are all here to help you. A short survey will be emailed to everyone. Please consider completing this. Uh, this helps our education team um, with all the feedback that they receive to ensure that we can bring you what you're actually after. A recording of this webinar will be sent to registered participants and available on the Leukemia Foundation website and also our YouTube channel. That draws today's webinar to a close. Thank you so much, everyone, and goodbye.